ahead and welcome everyone to this Care of Painted Services C2C Care webinar. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. And I'm just going to run through a couple of quick slides before we start today. And then I'm going to hand it over to our presenter. As I said, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I'm the CDC Care Coordinator. We also have a gentleman by the name of Mike Morno, who's our senior producer at Learning Times here today. Um, we are here to answer any kind of technical questions you might have or any kind of other issues you might have in the chat. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. I always like to review at the start of one of these webinars, um, our home on the web, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you'll be able to find our, basically our entire archive of all of the C2C care webinars. There are quite a few. Um, there's also a, a discussion area where you can join in. It's a C2C care community. Um, there you can go in and post questions that'll be actually be used and looked at by our group of fabulous volunteer monitors that then reach out to an expert group to get answers. So if you have questions on direct care to collections or any other items, I would encourage you to go check that out. We do have a current course happening for C2C Care. Courses are a little different than what the webinars are. Um, with courses, they're actually kind of, you have to pay for them, number one. The second thing is, is that they're kind of a deep dive into subjects. And the current course happening right now is called Building Collaborations Between Museums and Indigenous Communities. It started September 30th. It's gonna conclude October 28th. Um, I just wanted to bring it up because if you wanna join now, you can actually go ahead and pay the course fee. You will have access to the recordings of the previous webinars and then be able to join in on the live discussions happening. It's been a really interesting time. I would encourage you to go check out our website if you're interested in signing up for it. We also have an upcoming free webinar happening in November called Long-Term Storage for Large Functional Objects, Vehicles. During that webinar, we're actually going to be talking about how uh, various institutions deal with storing these kind of items, these large functional objects, vehicles. We are also encouraging our audience to submit examples. So if your collection currently handles a collection or an item like this and they have questions about it, our presenter by the name of Paul Storch will actually review it beforehand and give some tips during the live webinar. There is a submission form on our website, connectingtocollections.org, that you can submit either photos or if you want to do a quick video or anything like that. So I'd encourage you to go to the website to check it out. We do have two places that we live on social media as well. Um, they are Facebook and our Twitter account, at C2C Care. On both of those, you can actually um, find out what's happening within the community. So I would encourage you to join them or follow them if you haven't already. Now for those tech reminders, uh, as, a, as a Zoom webinar, you have access to two separate boxes. You have an access to a chat box and access to a Q&A box. The chat is there for chat. So if you wanna say hello, if you wanna say uh, where you're located, if you wanna talk about the weather, you are more than welcome to do so within that chat box. Um, also, if you have any, like I said, technical questions or anything else, put them in there. The Q&A box is for questions. So if you have a question for our speaker at any time during the webinar, put it in that Q&A box. We will then follow up during the Q&A period afterwards. Um, we really like that Q&A box that helps us track questions. And if I see a question in the chat box, I'll usually refer you over to the Q&A box. So I do encourage you to use that. Before we start this webinar, I would like to acknowledge that this is, webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors. And I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. So thank you again. And now I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. So our speaker today is Megan Emery, who is the Chief Conservator and Senior Objects Conservator at the Midwest Art Con Conservation Center, which is a nonprofit conservation center located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And without further ado, I'm going to hand control of the presentation over to her, and we'll see you at the Q&A period afterwards. Thanks, and see you soon. Thank you, Robin. I am going to pull up my screen here, share it with you. All right. Well, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am presenting from the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. This place has a complex and layered history, and I offer my respect to the elders who have stewarded the land throughout the generations and continue to do so. Well, welcome and thank you for joining me today as we talk about the care of painted surfaces. When asked to present on this topic, I was a little overwhelmed at first because it can be a very large topic. So many types of objects have been painted. However, it's also why it's a very important conversation to have. 
Paint and surfaces are found in virtually every collection. I'm gonna leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you have any specific objects in your collection or collection materials that you're concerned about um, as we go along, if I don't answer some of those questions during my presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A um, box as Robin suggested to put those questions in there. We'll make sure we get to answer as many as possible. Well, without further ado, let's begin. Oh. A little trouble screen sharing or advancing my slides. Hold on. There we go. All right. Well, when it comes to paint, there is tempera, casein, oil, acrylics, watercolor, wash, enamels, elkids. The list can go on and on. There are so many different types of paints. And as long as paint has been used to create any type of functional or art object, there are also many types of substrate, wood, metal, stone, concrete, glass, ceramics, painted canvas, fabrics, walls, decorative elements of all types in the home. There really is almost anything that could have been a painted surface. While this presentation is relevant to any type of painted surface because the condition issues are frequently the same, it really is focused heavily on three-dimensional objects as that's my specialty. However, wall paintings and painted wallpaper and other paintings do find some application in this conversation as well. So if that's the type of collection I, object you're concerned about, um, that you will find some information that is very relevant to that as well. Here is a beginning, just a few examples of objects that you may find that are painted in a collection. You have painted ceramic, painted wood, painted metal in the form of, in this case, a World War I helmet, painted glass, and painted plaster on a painted metal base. Many times when objects were painted, there was a decorative purpose in mind. However, paint was also applied to objects to be uh, protective, to have more of a functional use, um, to help metals um, slow down the rate of corrosion, to protect them from elements when used outside, for instance, on um, heavy duty industrial farm equipment or machinery. Um, painted furniture, a lot of times it was not only to cover up the wood, but it was to serve as a decorative purpose. Paint can also be purely decorative in the form of some decorative arts or fine art objects. Um, and it can be used again, like this is an example here of an um, antique coffee grinder. And that's a case where it's both decorative and protective. Many cases it is when paint is applied to the surface, it's not solely being protective if that was its function, but it was decoratively applied. For instance, this is a, um, a steam thresher from 1910. And it, while it's very difficult to tell now because of the paint is aged, it was decoratively painted with stripes and coloring and transfer patterns and all done in a way to be as decorative as possible while also providing a very basic function. A little bit about the science and understanding of how paint works. Durability and performance of paint depends on two main properties, cohesion and adhesion. When you have a substrate, whether it be glass or metal or whatever it may be, then you have the paint layer, you have the interface where they join. That interface is the area where adhesion takes place between the two, where a bond of some form is created. Cohesive strength is the strength of the actual paint film itself. And cohesive failure is something that's taking place inside the paint. We'll talk about examples of this as we move forward. Adhesion is the strength between the paint and the substrate. And this is when adhesive failure takes place, it's at that interface area. It's right at that very edge. And there are many factors that can cause cohesive and adhesive failure. Um, but again, we'll get through that a little bit more. There are also three types of principles that apply to good adhesion. Adsorption and adsorption a lot of times has to do with metals, glass, certain polymers, types of plastics that have high surface energies or higher surface energies than the paint. When you think of something, when you think of applying paint and the paint runs smoothly over the surface, if it drags or doesn't want to go, you don't end up with very wet or free flowing. That's then the paint has a higher surface energy than the object and it doesn't want to apply smoothly. That adsorption is what that is called, is how well that paint is applied to the surface. And that's really important in having good adhesion. 
chemical bonds also form between some paints and, their, and the substrate at the interface. And this happens a lot of times um, when a paint system has an additive or a functional, uh, re highly reactive functional group in, involved, adhes um, adhesion promoters. And this is a lot of times found in industrial paints, um, including some commercially available paints that are used. Um, some spray paints have them in there or house paints of various types. Um, they're really, they're additives in there to, ex to exercise an extra level of bonding between the substrate and the paint layer. And then there is min uh, mechanical interlocking. And this is something we run into the most. Um, and this is when you have a paint film on a substrate and that there's a surface texture. And so the paint actually penetrates in and kind of grabs on. And that's when you get a really tight adhesive bond between the substrate and the paint layer at that interface because there's some texture and you've got that penetration. So here's an example. This is a, um, a small glass sculpture that's painted by the artist Richard Marquis. And I provided the three kind of examples of this adsorption, chemical bonds, and mechanical. In this case, with painted glass, you've got great adsorption. The glass has a higher transition or higher surface energy, and it allows that paint to just roll smoothly over the surface, creating a beautiful decorative surface. However, so there is, you've got a good, a, a good way of bonding on that form. However, you have a poor chemical bond. There is no chemical reaction in this case taking place between the paint itself and the substrate. You also have a poor mechanical interlocking or poor, the surface of the glass is incredibly smooth. It wasn't at all manipulated prior to the paint being applied. And therefore, you don't have a strong bond that way. So this is an object where one could expect to see failure in the future. Here's an example of a large outdoor contemporary sculpture by Marc de Suvero. And this is a case where I actually was um, involved in repainting it, something that happens frequently with outdoor sculpture. But this is a case where um, there is great adsorption because, um, oh, but I can see that I didn't correct my slide here, where the metal has a uh, a higher surface energy than the paint itself and the paint flows across. I totally didn't change this, did I? Well, <laughs> sorry about that. But there's a good chemical bond in this case because there are additives applied in this paint. In fact, when you see this image right here with the gray background, that is actually a zinc-based primer that is applied to the metal first. And that's allowing there to be an actual chemical bond between the metal the zinc primer layer and the paint. So that you've got a really tight, durable bond. And that zinc primer also has a rough texture. So you're getting a good mechanical interlocking as well. So this is something where whether the artist originally intended it for it or not, it's all those properties are there and present. And so it's gonna have a good durability and last as long as it's possible in the outdoor environment. So, <clears throat> as we continue to talk about these durable paint layers, it rarely affects the actual objects, how these different, the adsorption and the chemical bonds and the interlocking. This rarely, these are all underlying happening in the objects we see in our collection. However, it's not usually what we're dealing with. We, we have to deal with the actual object. What is the substrate? What is the paint and what's happening between them? They are changing at a constant rate and depending on what those com that combination is, we never really know. So this is where we as collection stewards have to jump in and remember our agents of deterioration. I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard about agents of deterioration in one form or another. It's the list of factors that influence an object or collection's overall condition, and conservators and collection specialists love to talk about them, myself included. Every one of these can influence the rate of deterioration we see with painted objects. Normally, and when I'm giving a presentation, I would talk about each one specifically and how it directly affects the type of object. However, this is such a large topic with different types of paint, substrate, history, and use that we're going to actually talk about the different condition issues and kind of relate back to which agent of deterioration may influence them or how that could affect them. Um, so before I continue, this is a good point where I can just remind you again to use the Q&A box for questions. Um, I gave you just a very brief scientific background. Now we're really going to get into what we see on individual collection objects on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first one that we're going to look at is damage and deterioration. 
And as I'm going to just tell you that as I selected images, I am selecting details of images. So in very few cases, do you actually see a whole object? And the reason I'm doing that is because I really want you to see the problems, not the actual object itself. Um, and I'm hoping that you can see my pointer as well, because this is an example of a damage where you have, this is a painted shadow box. It has a painted canvas mounted to a wood board, but then it has a three-dimensional painted ship shadow in front of it or ship um, shadow figure or three-dimensional figure in front of it. Here's a case where the wood backing has actually cracked and split, causing the canvas to completely tear and there's paint losses along the surface. In this case, you have a painted plaster where there's been a physical force and um, actual problems within plaster and you've got large losses. So when you have a large damage to a work of art, you're inevitably gonna lose um, parts of the painted surface as well. Agents of deterioration that come into play with damage and deterioration are pretty much all of them. Physical force, vandalism can cause this, fire, water, pests, pollutants, light, temperature, RH, and neglect. Every one of the agents can cause flat out damage and deterioration, particularly with painted surfaces. Here's some more images that show examples of damage and deterioration on different types of substrates. Um, here you have a painted wood mirror frame and you also have a um, painted metal sculpture where you have found um, steel that has, um, a, has a, like an auto paint on the surface. It's actually parts of an automobile. And when you have um, a physical impact, but for instance down here, you actually get cracking from the paint in large areas of loss. Another problem that you can see is if you've got corrosion on a metal object, frequently that will also cause large areas of loss and deterioration as well. So these are examples where when the substrate is having a physical problem and it will cause damage to the painted surface. The next example that we're gonna do is looking at cracks, cracking. This is also called crack allure, or you may have heard of it referred to as alligatoring. All of these are different terms that conservators will use um, to refer to this type of, um, of condition issue. Many times the cracking remains and it just reveals a crack allure pattern. This very fine network, or in this case, a large network of cracks that develop across the surface. This is an example of a painted plaster. Here, you actually have a, a canvas painting where you have a very tight network of, of cracking that is occurring. And while those crackings are beginning, cracks are beginning to lift, you don't have any real sign of loss. This can result from the co poor cohesive strength. This is when we have a lack of flexibility in the paint coating versus the substrate. And so when the substrate is expanding or contracting, the paint is moving at a different rate, doesn't have the flexibility and these cracks develop. It can also be a result of physical force, fire, water, high temperature or inappropriate temperatures and high levels of RH. So again, some of our different agents are coming into play. Um, tenting and lifting. Frequently these go along with cracking where you actually see something happen where the paint is physically lifting. Another term for this is cupping. However, that is when the paint lifts up and actually cups on the edges. So lifting or tenting is when it moves up and cupping is when it comes like this. Um, this you have core adhesion at the interface. So this is a case where the substrate and the paint layer, again, aren't responding to the same things and there's a poor bond. So when one moves, the other one kind of goes and moves up overwards. So you've got large, long cracks that are lifting up the surface. And again, here is a really tight, small crack creating this lifting. Here are examples of flaking and peeling. Again, these are from poor adhesion or cohesion, um, the cohesive strength. You can have a failure in either the paint layer to cause this or at the interface. And this is an example where you just physically lose large chunks of paint. Um, here you've got paint on plaster, paint on wood, and paint on galvanized steel in an outdoor environment. <clears throat> um, this can be a result of physical force, vandalism, fire, water, pests, balloons, <laughs> light, temperature. All right, again, all of the agents come into effect in this particular condition issue. Here you see examples of blistering. Um, this is usually, again, for adhesion. And when you've got incompatible materials or contaminants. So this one, this example right here, this is a, um, uh, like an elkid or like a polyurethane based paint 
on a steel surface and you've got a clear coat that was applied, a clear, a clear polyurethane coating that was applied on the top. They didn't react well together. So as the polyurethane shrunk, it actually pulled the bottom paint layer right up off the surface, causing this large blister. And this is an example where you have um, a painting that was exposed to high heat, and that also is causing poor adhesion between the paint and the inner base. So this can happen from different types of things, but you will see these blisterings in paint. Um, moving a little from some of those physical things, we also have um, more or, or the larger losses that we immediately see. We see abrasion frequently with painted surfaces. This has to deal with the cohesive strength of the paint. A lot of times paint coatings just cannot tolerate being abraded or scratched or having any kind of um, object rubbing up against their surface. So here you have a Norwegian trunk that was um, over its lifetime had just a lot of exposure, um, different things set on top of it, different things, poor storage environments. And this is actually uh, a painted metal base that belonged to the sculpture of the plaster Madonna that was uh, shown earlier. And you can see that there's a metal, there's metal corrosion. And as things have been put on top of it, there was a lot of abrasion around the edges and you have a lot of loss of the painted surface from that. Stains and accretions are another category that we see a lot of problems with conditions for painted surfaces. Um, here, sometimes you can have an accretion that drips, some sort of a liquid stain um, that drips onto the surface. And then not only does it leave a residue behind, but it actually causes staining underneath. Um, this is an example of where you have a uh, paint from another object or from uh, being painted in an environment, painting taking place in an environment where the object is stored, and that paint has transferred onto the object itself, causing a non-original paint on top of a painted surface. And then in this example, you have um, a water soluble paint on top of hide that then experienced exposure to um, moisture and it caused bleeding and running and staining along with tide lines and um, discoloration. So these are all types of damages and condition issues that can occur. Discoloration is also something we see frequently. Um, here we have a piece of furniture that had multiple layers of varnish and oil applied over its life. And there was originally a painted decoration on the surface. However, it, over years, those varnish and coating layers have darkened and you no longer see clearly what the painted decoration was below. And again, we have a World War I helmet. And this is a case where um, over time, the paint has darkened from accumulated dirt and grime, and also because um, corrosion particulates from the steel below have actually migrated through, leaving little deposits of rust all over the surface of the helmet. Fading is something we see a lot with painted surfaces. This depends on the type of paint. Some paints are much more stable than others. Um, a lot of times uh, it depends on the amount of light level. So for instance, if you have a gallery display where you've got oil paintings and there's natural light, they may not have a problem. They're all durable enough. However, you wouldn't want them in direct sunlight. This is a case where an outdoor painted sculpture had been repainted on several campaigns and over time, the top layer of paint began to fade and discolor and become almost like a chalky appearance of its former self. It also abraded away and started to reveal the very distinct different color below. Um, so there's a lot of things going on here, but fading is definitely something to consider with um, in your light levels. Powdery paint or poorly bound paint. This happens a lot with folk art, decorative art objects, um, a Native American ethnographic material. Um, here, example, actually you have, this is a Papua New Guinea sculpture, Egyptian and Native American. And in all three of these cases, you have a high pigment to binder ratio, meaning there's a lot more dry pigments or loose pigment in the meat paint medium than there is paint medium. And so you don't have a nice binder holding that paint onto play, into place. In this is scenario, there's a, it's almost inevitable that you're gonna have areas of abrasion, loss, sometimes it'll be powdery on the surface. Um, it's just not going to wear well over time. Um, so you really have to consider those agents of deterioration to reduce those that as much as possible. And then we get right into the insect damage, which of course is always something we have to talk about. 
Um, even though it's a painted surface, there's a lot of times the insects will sometimes graze on the paint itself. However, most of the time they're going after the substrate, but that will cause um, tunneling, large areas of loss, loss of the structure, which again leads to the loss of that painted surface, um, exit holes that can, um, you know, again, disrupt the visual appearance of the object overall. No object is immune from these. And of course, biological growth. Um, again, mold will grow or biological growth of different types will grow on paint. Um, there's a lot of um, things that it can feed in, particularly when there's grime layers. And again, a lot of times they're going after the substrate as well, but then they will show up and be transferred onto the painted surface itself. Um, so this is something always to consider as well with your collection. And of course, there's dirt and grime layers. Um, with dirt and grime layers, we've always got the different buildups. It's going to change discoloration. It can lead to faster deterioration of the substrate. Um, it can change the appearance of the object overall. And it can actually, the accumulation of dirt and grime can actually lead to more complex cleaning problems or maintenance of problems of the collection as a whole. Um, and so with that, we're going to sort of get into some of those other types of, um, of storage and maintenance issues. So when I first started thinking about how I was going to present storage display maintenance, again, because there's this huge variety of types of objects that have a painted surface, I realized that the best part is going to be when we get to that Q&A and you can really ask me about specific types of materials and really your individual questions. I think that's going to be the most useful in this scenario. Um, however, I do want to talk about it generally and in a broad sense. Back to those agents of deterioration. Um, any storage or gallery space that's designed to reduce these, the way you handle objects, um, the way you train volunteers, um, obviously security issues to reduce vandalism theft, um, having in fire protection systems, um, trying to avoid flooding, all the things that we can do to reduce these are directly gonna impact the long-term care of our painted surface collections and, um, and slow down their rate of deterioration. There are a lot of problems as I've gone through that laundry list of condition issues that you can see with painted surfaces. And so it's really important that we stop and think about those ways that we can prevent this right from the beginning. Safe handling and storage. Um, one of the things with painted surfaces is that a lot of times they can snag, particularly if you want to look at an object very carefully. Do, does it do you? In, in, do you see clearly areas of lifting or flaking or some of these condition issues? And if you do, how do you handle it then? Um, those lifting and flaking powdery surfaces, unstable painted surfaces are really very sensitive um, to being handled. And there's a lot of risk of loss, even just from moving an object from one place to another. So some things that I like to suggest that you look at your collection regularly or really sensitive objects and take pictures on a regular basis um, once a year and look at their condition and document. What do you see? What do you ch what's changing? Is it getting worse? Um, that way you've got sort of a baseline of understanding how that surface is um, changing over time and if any condition issues are happening. And then you might be able to figure out what is causing that and how you can reduce it. Um, I mentioned that handling Nitrile gloves are something we frequently recommend over cotton gloves. Cotton gloves, um, painted surfaces so often have a rough texture or they snag or grip easily. And so they can leave cotton fibers behind and those cotton fibers can actually then pull off or cause more damage to a flaking surface. Um, always using two hands, um, properly transporting one, uh, an object from one place to another, just using good safe handling methods overall. Um, another thing is about storage. And with painted objects, again, it's really usually directly um, what is the substrate and what is the type of paint and what is, is it a contemporary art object? Is it folk art? Is it painted glass? Um, how you're really going to look at the larger material type to try to understand what the best method of storage is. However, anytime you have a painted surface, the things to really take into consideration is that you don't want to cause any abrasion or 
paint transfer to the surface. Um, when paint is transferred from one object onto another or it's abraded, then what happens is that it's really sometimes a condition issue that can't be addressed. Um, a lot of times if they're, if for instance, if you have a large group of like objects and one object were to transfer paint to another, um, you may not you have a difference in solubility to where that paint layer could be removed from that's non-original. Um, you wanna make sure that you're not causing any loss or things by having in, in contact with another. You also want to make sure that they're in contact with smooth or appropriate surfaces. Again, that you don't want um, like a really rough surface to be in contact with a really smooth painted surface. Um, you want to think about what may cause extra damage um, as you go on with storage. Again, specific questions, please put them in the, in the chat box because this is uh, or in the Q&A because that'll be the best way to talk about some. So when it comes to maintenance or maintaining and taking um, some cleaning of all these types of objects, um, there's always our HEPA vacuums that we love to vacuum and uh, maintain collection items with. Um, you frequently, what we'll wanna do with a HEPA vacuum is actually take the end, um, the micro attachment and wrap it and, um, and put a cheesecloth or something over the top or a fine netting over the top or vacuum through a screen so that you're not actually vacuuming up any paint flakes or anything that may come with it. Um, a lot of times also taping off the plastic ferrule so you don't have any risk of abrasion. Um, looking for examination techniques, um, looking at using a small bright light to look at an object or using a UV flashlight to see if there's any weird condition issues or problems with surface coatings, um, having a tweezers to get small fibers off, um, different types of dusting brushes and things that you can very gently clean. These are a lot of our very common cleaning tools um, and something that we use for a lot of different types of object maintenance. When it comes to dusting, uh, painted surface. Um, we recommend that you have um, almost never wipe it down with just a full cloth. It's really best to use a brush and goat hair brushes, badger hair brushes, Chinese hockey brushes are all really excellent general dusting brushes. Um, for painted canvases or really delicate painted surfaces, um, the badger hair brush is the most ideal. It also happens to be the most expensive and not always a practical solution. Um, you want them to be a natural fiber and the larger the better, although having a variety of sizes is really beneficial. Again, you want to tape off that metal ferrule um, or and even sometimes with the edge of some of the wood ones, what you want to do is take painter's tape and wrap it around there and that just reduces the risk of any abrasion from that metal ferrule coming in contact with the painted surface. And as brushes, um, particularly with some of the more inexpensive brushes, as they become dirty, it's really a great idea to dispose of them and um, obtain new. And if it's a higher in quality brush, you can use your vacuum to vacuum the brush really well. Some brushes can be um, rinsed and then just dried thoroughly. Although in many cases that leaves those bristles not quite as soft. So that's not always the best method either. When actually dusting, um, for example, here in this case, you can see a hockey brush that has been taped, the nitrile gloves, and the vacuum is actually collecting. So you're using the brush to slowly wipe away the dirt, but the vacuum to pull it off um, and so that it doesn't come off. A lot of times that's a better method with the painted surface to lightly clean versus just vacuuming, because sometimes that vacuuming actually adds more friction than is necessary and can cause problems. Um, very, brush very slowly and gently, usually starting in one direction and then going in an opposite direction. If you have a vertical surface, for example, uh, a painted wall or a canvas or something that's on a vertical surface, you want to usually go in a vertical and then a horizontal. Um, with three-dimensional objects, it's usually kind of working in a downward direction and then maybe kind of brushing off the base or anything that you have. Um, you, again, you really don't want to use any kind of um, a dust cloth that could be rough or cause problems. Definitely no, don't introduce moisture. Stiff bristle brushes should be avoided and feather dusters as well. Feather dusters, while they seem so gentle and soft, they really leave those fibers behind and they get snagged in that painted surface and they can be very challenging to remove those fibers later on. Um, and also be careful because um, I hear of a lot of collections using Swiffer 
dusters. I love Swiffer dusters at home. I think they're fantastic and I use them on almost everything. However, in a museum collection, not only do they lose, um, leave fibers behind, but a lot of them have added scents nowadays. Some of them have added, added polishing compounds. And so you need to make sure, like for instance, I know that there are some that have pledge or something like that and added to them as an extra pickup of dust, but they really, you don't want to because anything that is in there can actually be transferred um, onto the surface of the object and can cause other problems later on. So when to call a conservative? One of the things that I hoped to do is give you as many tools that you can use yourself um, to take care and maintain your collections with painted surface objects. However, the problem is, is that painted surfaces are incredibly delicate and they have so many condition issues and that they can really become problematic. So there's a lot of times um, where it's gonna be important to just have talk to a conservator, ask them the best way to approach that specific object um, and also maybe have them carry out the treatment. Um, here are a few examples of that. This is a small contemporary glass sculpture called Proof and it has a wood base and painted glass on top. Well, first thing is the base is actually a combination of charred wood and applied paint. So where you have that applied paint on the base, it's got a very rough texture. Um, there's a risk of taking off some of the ash from the char and the paint when cleaning. Um, but then, and I'm hoping it's, you can see it's very hard to photograph glass and get this clear in this large detail of these teeny tiny little glass shells. Um, the artist actually painted parts of the shells to create these different shadows and light and dark areas, and they're all piled and glued together uh, or adhered together with silicone adhesive. Um, there's a lot of flexibility and mobility in these pieces as well as they're not really tightly bound to one another. The problem with this thick layer of dirt and grime that is accumulated is, as you know, with some glass objects, you get a grimy film in addition to just that loose particulate. And when trying to do any loose dusting, you may take off some of the dust, but you can't really get into the crevices and you really can't address that grime. Um, when it came to the conservation lab that I work at, um, the problem we found was that the paint had sort of like the painted object I presented in the very beginning where it had um, good adsorption, but it did not have any chemical bonding or interlocking um, properties. It was very poorly bound and the paint had the same solubility of all the different types of agents that would properly clean the glass. So it became a monitor of doing under a microscope and selectively cleaning the areas where there was not paint. And in some areas where the grime was so heavily built up, working with the, um, with the curator, the owner, and actually determining whether a small amount of paint loss was actually preferential to the really grimy appearance that was going to cause deterioration to the glass and really um, change the way the art was supposed to be viewed. So you've got something that should be so simple. Removing grime from a clean glass object is very straightforward. However, in this case, that paint layer really complicated both cleaning of the base and of the object itself. Um, here is the World War I helmet that has shown up in several of my slides. So this is just a great example. Um, part of it is it has a wonderful history. This is an, uh, an object that's in a private collection and it is actually um, a family member in this, in this collection. It's the family member who was in World War I and had painted his helmet while he, and it has a map of all of the different battles of where he had been. And so it's got a really wonderful history. It's a great historical object. Um, but when it came to the lab, it had a very um, grimy and deteriorated um, surface coating on the surface that had darkened. As I mentioned prior, um, some of the rust had actually transferred up through the paint, through pits and pitted areas of corrosion, leaving um, rusty corrosion on top of the surface. And then there was just a general layer of grime. This is a case where um, having it done clean by a conservator, there is no straightforward way to tell somebody how to clean this without testing different solutions and different chemicals to identify what is the solubility of the paint? Is it a discolored coating or is it just natural grime properties? And also what can we do to clean the paint safely while not causing any additional harm to the metal that is already somewhat unstable. Um, so here you can see the before and the after of and how much um, it visually changed dramatically as far as removing that layer of grime and 
reducing some of the um, corrosion deposits on the paint, but not fully removing them. This is um, a double-sided outdoor sign from a small tea room, uh, the Red Geranium Tea Room. And this is something that came to the lab because it's a historic object. They were not bothered by the amount of loss. However, they were bothered by the fact that it was actively flaking and there was a lot of risk for their loss in the collection. Um, they really wanted to maintain the sign as is. Um, and so paint stabilization is one of, and consolidation, sometimes we call it stabilization, sometimes we call it consolidation. But really what it is, is introducing a, a, an adhesive or a binder underneath the existing paint that is appropriate for both paint type and the substrate, and then find a way to mechanically or let it set back down so that paint becomes stable. Many times when an object has flaking or lifting or losses of paint, this is something that will be an ongoing condition. There is a reason why it is happening or why it has happened in its past and it's likely to continue. But what we wanna do is stabilize and maintain as much of it as we can going forward. So here you see the detail of, um, of the flower pot and just how lifted the paint was. And um, this is an example of actually setting down those paints. Um, multiple different methods were tested, different types of adhesive, different types of heat, like how to apply the heat. Um, this is in this case, um, this area of white is actually um, a slow humidification process where the paint was very brittle. It's on galvanized steel and it was basically like an industrial house paint um, or a commercial house paint, oil based. And so it was very brittle and did not want to set. There was not only cohesive failure, but adhesion failure. And so the paint was humidified and to soften so that when we tried to set those flakes back, they didn't just break off. Then a, a consolidant and adhesive was wicked underneath those little tiny flakes of paint, allowed to sit for 24 hours. It was a heat reactive adhesive. And then heat was brought back in later um, with a silicone release mylar barrier. And that was then used to set those humidified flakes back down into place and really create that bond. Here you see an example of before and after consolidation. Um, and this is a case where um, we did do some selective filling of areas of loss, but for the most part, we did not. Um, and I can talk about a little bit about that in this next slide, which is another thing that conservators will frequently talk to you about with loss compensation um, when addressing painted surface objects, particularly historical objects. Um, as I'm sure many of you were aware, conservators really try to take into cons um, consideration the type of object, its use, and its history to determine how far is appropriate for given treatment. Um, with this geranium tea room sign, um, the decision was that there were a few really distracting areas of loss. Um, for example, right, some large losses right in the letters and, and a big one in one of the flowers on the opposite side. And it was decided to very selectively in paint those areas that were distracting and yet leave all of these smaller losses untouched as part of the natural history. Here you can see this Norwegian trunk I showed you earlier when talking about abrasion and how the abrasion has really caused a very visually distracting surface appearance on the top of the trunk. The design was no longer legible. Um, in this case, after it was cleaned and the conservator was able to look at it very closely, the lines of the design were very clearly visible beneath some of those areas of abrasion. You could see, you could connect the dots. And so in this case, the decision was made to actually do loss compensation where all of these large areas of abrasion were toned back to match the color of the oxidized wood surface. And then they were in painted with a medium of different solubility than the original, so they could be reversed in the future. And yet you've got a legible surface. So these are some of the reasons why a conservator may be brought in. Um, there are many types of ways we treat painted surface object or painted surfaces. Um, but again, it can be really specific to the individual object type. And with that, I think we're gonna dive into your questions and answers because I think I can really provide some more one-on-one -on -one case specific examples um, getting into that. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, that is a huge subject. So I get, I think it's good that we can start looking at questions and we already have questions. So it works out well. 
Um, one of the first questions that came in says, what can you do to help prevent paint loss on objects installed outdoors that are used by animals for their bio breaks? For when they pee. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a common problem I run into. Um, <clears throat> I deal with a lot of outdoor sculpture and a lot of times what ends up happening, well, if there's any way you can, the best way to do is try to prevent them having access and you know, trying to stanch it off or try to reduce um, access sometimes a lot of times if there's like well if it's against a sidewalk or something it doesn't necessarily matter but if it's there's more of a grassy area and there's a concrete between or some sort of gravel barrier um, around the base of the sculpture sometimes that can help reduce that um, however if you do have that and it's an outdoor durable paint the best scenario would actually be to just wash it as much as you can. Um, just keep rinsing it off as you have access. I hope that can kind of answer that question because that is always a tricky one. Yeah, I think we did an earlier C2C C Square um, webinar on outdoor sculptures too that I would refer everyone to look back at that because I might have some more tips and tricks specifically for um, bio breaks, which I think I'm going to start using all the time yeah and it and yeah. it really does it's very acidic and it can really break down the paint layer very quickly um and it can cause a lot of staining as well so it is it is something to pay attention to mm -hmm. for sure um next question is how are discoloration and fading different usually we consider fading as the color lightens or deteriorates in that direction um and discoloration is where it shifts from its original color to another. For instance, if it has a slight, if it has a coating and the coating becomes more yellow or the paint colors shift to a slightly darker shade, we would call that as a discoloration, whereas fading is when you see sort of an overall lightening effect. Um, both can be caused by light exposure, so it just depends on the medium and what type of light it's exposed to. They can also be ex um, caused by um, additives in the paint or by the paint type itself. Sometimes it has a reaction between the substrate and the paint. For instance, when you have a paint on a metal object, if there is um, oxidation or corrosion of the metal below, that can transfer and cause darkening or discoloration of the painted surface as well. So that's usually where we consider the difference between discoloration and fading. Um, as fading is usually when things go on the lighter side. Um, so what are the considerations one should make while deciding which adhesive must be used for laying a flaking paint? Should one use a rigid adhesive, they have paraloids or flexible ones, PVA emulsions? Honestly, it totally depends on the type of object. And actually, conservators have a whole a much larger scope of adhesives um, just between some of the paraloids and some of the PVA emulsions that we look at. Um, the reason why it's so specific is it depends on what is the substrate. Uh, is it does it need to be flexible? Does it need to be rigid? How is is what is its environment? Is it going to expand and contract a lot? Is it on a wood based surface? Is it on glass? Um, it and what is the type of paint? There is almost it, and even when you have the exact same scenario over and over again, sometimes it really does depend on is it tinted cleavage, is it actually just lifting flaking paint, or is it cupping, and what and what's causing it to. So unfortunately, I can't really give you a very specific answer to it. I'm kind of going back. Oh, the questions disappeared. I can't. Oh yeah, here I can see it. <laughs> I'm gonna just say. Um, uh, so as far as the rigid versus flexible, we usually choose. Um, I, again, it depends. What is that environment going? Is it going to have a lot of expansion and contraction? Is it going to stay the same? And so I'm almost hesitant to say, give you an, ex I'm trying to think of an exact example of when one would be better over the other. Um, but again, it's really a case by case basis. Yeah, I know it can be hard sometimes giving you that exact thing, but I would also say that we have um, Megan's con, we have some of our information on our website. So I bet if you want to send her an email, you may be yes. able to some pictures because she bought me Absolutely. yeah if yeah if you have an actual like object and pictures of it and then we can get more into the specifics and that's why that's why i mean this is a i love painted surfaces i love painted objects of all types but it is really tricky when you have such a large variety of options on what the paint or substrate is um so next question says if you have to wrap a painted surface and can't do a shadow box type of thing to keep the wrapping material off the surface what is the best material to have touch the surface? And then they go on to say, I understand the ideal may not be have anything touch it, 
but we have less than ideal circumstances. So I think we're like in real world, <laughs> like, what would you have it touch? I, I, yes. uh, less than ideal circumstances. I think we all live in that in the museum world. I mean, we always want ideal, but it's hardly ever as that would it can be. Um, if you need to wrap something, uh, it would depend on the type. Of, so you want to think, is this paint surface at all tacky? If it's got any kind of tack to it and there's a risk of something adhering or becoming stuck to the surface, whether that be a deteriorated coating, an oily layer on the surface of grime, or actually like a softer paint, for instance, um, an acrylic or an oil that may not be, like it, sometimes acrylics can remain kind of tacky and oils if it's not fully dry. Um, then you want to not wrap it. <laughs> if you can at all avoid it, um, there are for things that are more stable. Dartec is a really good material. It is. Uh, it's a. I believe it's a polyester, but it is a very thin plastic sheet. It's like mylar. It's a little bit more affordable. It's very thin and it's very easy to wrap. I wouldn't recommend it for long term storage as it does tend to sort of cloud and kind of break down over time. So if you're going to do something for a long term, then I would use a really thin mylar. Um, and again, just kind of pay attention if there's any way you could frame it, like if it's a flat Thing, you could frame it or if it's a three-dimensional and you can place it in a box and then just wrap the top of the box if there's any way that you can keep it from direct contact that is always the best scenario um, and again that is a case where if you have a specific object type that you want to send me pictures of later on I'd be happy to answer that more directly so the next question is one of the big debates of the universe pretty much it deals with gloves so it says regarding proper handling of painted objects, where do you stand on the gloves, no gloves debate? And why? Is proper hand washing enough to mitigate possible contaminants? Is the added tactile dexterity enough to justify it? Well, one thing I would say is that if you're going to wear gloves at all, I would go for nitrile because they help with all those scenarios. Um, they really did get, do give you more manual dexterity, particularly a proper fitting nitrile glove should be tight. It should not be loose or baggy because that doesn't help with the dexterity at all. Um, but so if you have a tight fitting nitrile glove um, that is powder free, um, you don't want any kind of like residue on the surface. Um, that would be my first case scenario because it can apply to any type of object. Um, if you our washed hands is your next best bet if you can't wear a glove and keeping them clean if you're going to go in and handle a bunch of I apologize for the cat. Um, if you have and we made it so far without one of my animals intruding but um, if you can um, wash your hands right before you're going to do it so you have as little hand oil as possible that can be um, acceptable although if it's a metal object even painted metals sometimes that oily residue or painted glass that residue can be a little bit harder to remove and cause more problems later on um, so i'd really say with like painted canvas painted ceramics um, stone marble all of that you can get by with in the washed hands, uh, or freshly washed hands, and just wash frequently. Um, and then also consider what you might be handling and wash afterwards as well. There are all sorts of contaminants we just don't want on our hands. Um, so that's where I stand on the glove debate. As a conservator, I'm frequently found without gloves on, but we always say there's an exception to that rule. So that's why I say nitrile first. Um, I, someone in the chat says, never apologize for cats. So don't worry about the cat, number one. <laughs> Um, number, okay. number two, I think the gloves thing is really interesting because I was, when I came up in the mid O's, it was gloves, 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 right? And then we've seen this kind of new world open up where it's clean hands are really important. And what's come, what's come up in the uh, building collaborations course that we're doing right now, which is working with tribal populations and all that, is that sometimes when you're inviting people into your collections to get information, it's hard for those groups to be Number one, to come into our collection sometimes for a multitude of reasons. And then the next thing is kind of, okay, now you have to like glove up. And it's like, it just creates these like barriers to get to the object. So I think as a collections person, it's always good to try to do best standards and use for what mm -hmm. you can, kind of like you described. But at the same time, it's always just clean hands is the most important thing to me, either before and after we're done handling those objects. Yes. Because I think both sides of that, but it, like I said, it was interesting because it really came up in that course we're doing lately about how just
putting the gloves on and doing all this can just build barriers to sometimes bringing people into our collections and providing access. And obviously this is a little different, but I just thought I'd point that out because it's come up mm -hmm. in this discussion. Well, and it's also something that comes up with, I think about um, a lot of like library and archive scenarios where you have maybe a rare book and you want somebody, a lot of times the st older standard was to wear cotton gloves. Um, and the problem is cotton gloves tend to hold hand oils and skin oils in them because they're frequently handled before they're put on. And so then you've got the transfer of the oils already on the outside of the glove. They don't get washed as much as they should. And sometimes when it comes to that dexterity problem, you're more likely to bend or turn a corner or cause a, you know, a full crease, whereas a clean hand is much less likely to do anything. So it really is, but again, it's that, well, there's that risk. And if someone doesn't know what they're, you know, going to handle. And of course, there is that also like a cultural barrier. You don't want to invite someone in who is part of their cultural heritage or their family heritage even and say, hey, put a glove on before you handle your own family photographs that were donated here. You know, you don't want to exactly. do that. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting debate that goes beyond just it's all collections care, but it's just kind of yeah. beyond physical damage. It goes on. Yeah. To another. So anyway, yeah. We need to have a whole like a series on glove usage at some point and how it's evolving. But in any yes. case. Um, next is what types of solvents are best for wood, metal, and glass when cleaning grime? Do you have any opinion on that? It depends. If they're painted, I would say none of them. <laughs> If it's a painted surface, um, if it is an unpainted glass, um, just sort of a standard glass object, the best cleaning solution is an ethanol water combination, 50-50 is my favorite. Um, and using a very, um, they have microfiber cloths specifically designed for glass, um, never applying the liquid directly to the glass, but applying it to the microfiber cloth and then using that to wipe clean for straight up glass. Um, if it's painted glass, that could be problematic depending on the type of paint that's present. Um, if you have wood, I would avoid most liquids um, just because you don't know. Again, this is a case where if you have a picture or a specific object in mind, feel free to ask. Um, but if you've got like painted furniture, even if it has a, uh, like a coating that seems really durable, there could be blanching that's a result of like any kind of solvent or liquid. So I just, there's too many variables. Um, and with metals, um, again, painted metals, depends on what that paint layer is. Um, so if we're talking about straight metals, not a painted surface, depends on what the metal is. <laughs> but a lot of times um, either ethanol or mineral spirits works pretty well. But again, this is, it's really case by case. So I'm hesitant to say anything specifically, um, but happy to answer further more specific questions. Uh, going still on the subject of cleaning, um, someone's asking, what did you use to clean the helmet? She says, I'm sorry, but she missed when you mentioned it, but they were. I stuff. didn't actually mention what I used to clean the helmet. Um, I used a, a combination of different things. First, I used um, uh, uh, like a, 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 a water-based cleaning system to clean it. And then I went, uh, once I understood that the, that was to get sort of the basic layer of grime. First, I dry cleaned it. Then I did more of a water-based cleaning solution to remove a little bit more of the grime. Um, it was a tri head trimonium citrate at a low percentage. And then after that, I followed it up with a little bit of solvent in selective areas. Um, and I believe it was ethanol, but I would have to review my notes to tell you about that. That was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, bit, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that Again, if you have a similar object in your collection, I would look a little more closely because it may have been, you know, created differently. We run into the fact that unfortunately no object is created the same. <laughs> and there are always so many variations that it can be difficult to have one answer for anything. Yeah, I can see that. Um, this is interesting. It says, are, are there any tips for cleaning sticky spider webs off painted surfaces? So if something's starting to adhere, what would you Ooh, do? To keep painted. I'd start dry. I would start trying with like, and that's a case where you could maybe take a dry cloth and see if you can't wipe off the sticky debris. Um, depending on what the substrate is, if you can give us any more specifics, I might be able to give a little bit more detail. Um, but a lot of times if you get it off, 
with a dry cloth and then sometimes polyurethane sponges. They're cosmetic sponges. You can find them in any kind of makeup store. They're very, very soft and they can actually pick up a lot of dirt and grime on the surface of things. In fact, they were, there was an image of um, polyurethane sponges in my um, cleaning overall slide and also soot sponges, but soot sponges on painted surfaces can be a little rough because they're, they're um, vulcanized rubber and they have more texture to them. So sometimes they could be slightly abrasive, although most cases they're okay to just kind of pick up extra layers of loose particulate if the paint is stable. Um, so someone's asking, so if a collections manager finds a flaked paint chip from a work, Mm -hmm. Should it be kept for a conservator to reattach, or does it depend on the work or the size of the flake? So the question is, is when do you, when, and this is always a hard thing as a, as a trained registrar, is like, when do you stop <laughs> and reach out to the conservator? Or, and that's going to be slightly personal. Yeah, it, it is. It's going to be based on your own, you know, like what, how specific you feel you are in the collection and the collection object itself. If it is an incredibly you know, significant objects for whatever reason, or whether it be historical significance or importance or value. Um, if you retain the chip and if it's like really visually distracting, you know, if you retain it, yes, we can put it back on. Um, in most cases, a lot of uh, frequently we'll get objects and we'll get some large pieces of chips and then we'll get a lot of powder. That powder we really can't reuse as much as we would like to say we can, it, we're not going to be putting it back on. Um, so I think it, what is the size of the chip? Um, do you know clearly where it comes from? Sometimes we get bags of chips and we can find 80% of them. And then there's those few where like, we're not going to put it back where it doesn't actually belong because that wouldn't really be appropriate either. Um, so we would almost rather, you know, in paint or stabilize that somewhat in a different way. Um, I would say save what you can and then let the conservator decide at the point at which you feel it needs to go to a conservator. If you have a really actively flaking object, I would send it as soon as you can to, or at least put it in a, talk to a conservator and know how to store it, display it, um, keep it away from dust and light to try to reduce the long-term effects until you can have it treated. So someone says we have some outdoor farm equipment that has been painted and repainted over the years. They need to be painted again. Is there a better type of paint for items like these? I think they're mostly metal, but may have some wood bits as well. Yes. Um, so this is this is painted farm equipment that gets repainted is actually very similar to large painted contemporary outdoor sculpture. Um, it is sort of assumed that well. With, with contemporary outdoor sculpture, it's assumed that a painted sculpture is going to have to eventually be repainted because it, you're, that paint coating is going to deteriorate. If you have farm equipment or any kind of um, historic machinery that is was originally painted and has in the, 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 your collections policy is to just repaint it as necessary, then I would say that the biggest thing you wanna do is make sure that Whatever you do, there is a really good adhesion between the old paint and the new paint or completely strip it off or strip down to what was most likely the original. And the reason being is that if you have dirt grime layers in between, you're gonna have poor adhesion. And so you anything you put on, you wanna go. Um, I would look at, um, there are a lot of different paint systems and now um, a lot of times talking to a local paint representative. For instance, you can talk to Sherwin-Williams and say, okay, I have this type of um, machinery, it's outside, it needs this kind of durability, it should have this kind of a gloss or matte or color. You can sometimes have those colors specifically custom matched if you need to make sure it's the exact same. Um, so there, there's a lot of flexibility and different types of systems that conservators are recommending. Um, so I would say it's, it's that's individualized, but yes, you can talk to somebody about getting more specifics. And really the best case scenario is if you don't wanna involve a conservator is to just kind of know that the best interaction between the existing surface and that new paint, you want that to really work well together. Some paints don't bond to other old paints or don't bond to certain types of metals. Sometimes if you're gonna strip it, you have to actually prepare the metal in a certain way and that may not be appropriate for the farm equipment based on the interstices and the type of metal it is. And so again, you wanna really think about it 
on a case by case basis, um, but making sure that you've got good adhesion properties. And so talking to a specific paint representative would work from whatever company you feel appropriate. I love the idea of talking to a paint rep. Like, I think that's a super good idea because I bet there are some, I used to know a guy who worked in the paint industry and he also would often hook people up with free paint sometimes. So yeah. that's, that's a really good way of looking at it of, of, cause he would just know who to go to. So yeah, I love that idea. That's great. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times if particularly if this is a local small institution and you have a local paint store that really wants to take, sometimes they'll donate the supplies even, or help you really custom match something or mix it up specifically. Like they can find records of what it may have been. There's lots of ways that you could, you know, make that community connection, but then also um, understand that it is that durability and that adhesion property. That's when some of those things I talked about at the very beginning, um, um, that chemical bonding and the interlocking, you really want that. If you have a really broken up old deteriorated coating and you don't, you know, sand down or strip off the areas that are flaking, you're just going to have a new failed coating. And so you really want to make sure you know what type of paint you're using and what, how the surface needs to be prepared. Um, going back to the wrapping conversation we were having earlier, someone asked about the use of glassine for wrapping mm -hmm. and what your thoughts were on that. Um, I, I'd almost wish one of our paintings conservators was here to talk a little bit about this. We see glassine used to wrap painted surfaces a lot. And unfortunately, it's a very common material that um, is used but we more often than not find the glassine has actually stuck to the surface and with the expand with, if it, there's exposure to humidity or moist, higher moisture levels in the air, sometimes that glassine reacts with the paint and actually sticks to the surface. Um, I've just particularly with a lot of um, newer works of art um, and, and it's also sort of crunchy for a lot. It's, it's, it's got a heavier texture. So if it's, like a, an object that has a delicate or flaking surface, it's actually gonna more likely to cause abrasion because it is more rigid um, than some of the softer, uh, more flexible films. So our sort of general rule is if you're unsure, don't use it. Um, that there are places where it is appropriate, um, but in a lot of cases, it's not appropriate. Interesting. Um, someone says, if I notice that a painting has started to, started to show signs of crack lore, how will I know what agent of deterioration caused it? What is the first thing to check for and or alter? Well, I would, I'd look at your environment first. That's just me though. But what do you yep. think? Um, your environment, if you have um, a, a, a crack, so it's like it's a painting, for example, and you have actual is sort of like a physical force that as something hits it, you may get sort of a circular kind of radiating pattern. That would be if you, so if you notice that your cracks are happening in sort of like kind of a concentric circles or kind of radiating out from a central point, that usually has to do with impact of some form, um, whether it was bumped and then it kind of caused it from there. Um, that's usually for something that's got more of a flexible support. Um, or like if you would also notice that if you had like a metal object that had a, you know, had some sort of impact and then there was a dent, you kind of see how it kind of breaks out as it goes. Um, if you're just getting general crack lore and it's stable, if it's not lifting along the edges, if it's well bound, a lot of times that just has to do with the drawing of the paint itself. Um, so a lot of times old objects just naturally have it. A lot of times, even in fired ceramics, you'll see this little crack lore in the glaze. And a lot of times that has to do with um, with just like what's happened and how it ages over time and how it just sort of crizzles or cracks. And so if it's stable, then you don't have to worry about it as much, but definitely check your environments just to make sure. Um, if it's unstable, then you want to definitely, again, first thing, it would be the environment and finding out if it's lifting and what you could do and whether or not um, what, what it could be. But yeah, environment is usually the first one. Um, Humidity, temperature. Mm -hmm. Well, this leads us to this next question because as many people know, I'm located in Florida and this next question is from Florida. It says, we have a set of painted wooden carriages which are temporarily being housed in a warehouse without climbing control. And then it says mm -hmm. in Florida, yikes, until a new exhibit building is ready about two years down the line. We have observed paint flaking and cracking in the meantime. What steps can we take to limit the damage from humidity and temperature changes during this transitional time? That is rough because I can attest that Florida 
it, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a bit rough here. Yeah. If there is any way that you could introduce dehumidify, I mean, that's a, it's tough in an outdoor space with large objects like that. If there is any way you can reduce the humidity by having more air circulation or dehumidifiers, um, anything you can it, maybe pop, I mean, it would take a whole lot of silica gel or desiccant to try to dry out that space. Um, but that there's not really much you can do to the object itself. It's the environment. And so it's, it's more of just documenting it and watching it, monitoring it and doing what you can. And unfortunately it's a, it's a purely environmental effect. And um, you, you don't really want to introduce adhesive or anything because then that's just going to cause a new problem when you bring it back to a more stable environment. Um, so you just want it to slow it down as much as you can by, even if you can just reduce the humidity a little bit with a few dehumidifiers or trying to like block off airflow space or you don't want to lock it in if it's a humid space, but if you can try to, you know, either have a lot of good airflow or like seal off a window that is particularly drafty or however you can benefit, improve the space, I'd yeah. go for it. I would think like what you said about air circulation is interesting because I know that like um, there's been a problem when, when places down here get cut off with power. Right. And right now the museums or institutions are so hermetically seer, sealed, I like to think that mm -hmm. if there's no air circulation and our humidity levels go up the roof. Like I know folks in Puerto Rico and stuff, they often are able to open up windows and able to open up doors to at least allow that circulation to go through to try to stop yep. mold growth and like all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it would be interesting to kind of, I would think too, you might want to monitor it a little bit and see like if the, if the humidity is going off the roof, then it might be, okay, how can we get some air circulating in here? How can we get things kind of a little bit more stable? just generally mm -hmm. within the space would be something to look at as well. Absolutely. Um, so what should I use for daily dusting instead of our beloved Swiffers? Should something that can be hard <laughs> to reach spots, what should be an ideal daily cleaning routine? I love Swiffers too, but yeah, I agree <laughs> that they can't be in museums, sadly. Um, so if, if it is the majority of the objects are, we'll just say painted surfaces, cause that's what we're you know talking about mainly, um, a soft brush or in, I mean, earlier I said, don't use dust cloths. Um, if it's a furniture, for example, and it has a nice hard, a really smooth finish, that's not flaking, you can get by with a dust cloth. Um, uh, microfiber cloths work great, um, keeping them clean. And sometimes one thing I'll say, they can be re, um, washed frequently, which is great, because they can be reusable. But sometimes my microfiber cloths, when they get washed, they start to get hard little particulates like stuck in them, little fibers. And you wanna make sure you don't have those because they can be abrasive and scratch. Um, so if you have a smooth, compact, hard surface, then yes, you can use a cloth. Um, but if anything that's highly textured or um, friable, you want to use a, a light brush um, or lightly vacuum if you can. Uh, someone says, how can we prevent corrosion spots on painted metal objects, especially outdoor, and how can one treat them after they appear? Is removing the paint the only way to treat the underlying corrosion? Um, no, removing paint is not always the outdoor. Why do we put things outside? <laughs> metals outside, painted metals, they're my least favorite because they're so hard. Um, but to answer the question, I would say that there's, it depends on the metal. It depends on the paint. A lot of times there are different sorts of pacifiers where you can actually apply a solution and sort of like stop the metal corrosion, which if it's causing pitting or causing loss of paint, sometimes that can slow it down. Doesn't mean it's not going to start somewhere else. They're not always solutions that can go over. Sometimes wax coatings can help reduce that. Um, again, it depends on what the type of object is and if it can tolerate a wax coating on the surface or another, uh, a durable clear coat of some sort. Um, it's object by object. There's no like easy product that you can just apply and have it stop. Um, there's no easy solution to this one. 
Um, if it's a smaller object or an object that could be inside or outside, and there's any way to move in, in if you find that this is becoming an ongoing problem, that's ideal if you don't want to have to repaint regularly. Um, and when I say regularly, really, with most collection objects, you outdoor objects, you want to repaint as little as possible, because every time you repaint, you're getting farther and farther away from that original. And so it's, you know, really making sure that it's as far out as you can. Small losses in paint where there's metal corrosion, a lot of times the best method is to actually cover up the corrosion with no paint. So you, and a lot of times we'll do that locally. So if you have a small like area of pitting and corrosion coming through, we'll actually maybe locally like sand it down a little bit and then apply the paint. If you have the same paint, that's the best choice. Otherwise a stable conservation approved paint that is durable enough for outside that can easily be removed from that other painted surface in the future for full treatment would be best. Perfect. And this goes back to our earlier question a little bit about the spider web. Someone says, what do you do with fly and insect droppings on the surface? Now I'm going to guess it's mechanical removal first, but it is mechanical <laughs> removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times, um, a lot of times a really sharp scalpel blade and very carefully or like a um, uh, like a metal spatula, you can kind of like just knock them off. Don't be surprised if they take that paint with. A lot of times, particularly matte, powdery paints, poorly bound paints, that paint will come right off. If it's got a hard, durable, clear coat or a really like stable layer of paint, you're going to have less likely that to happen. But of course, most of the historical objects that end up with fly specks don't have that kind of surface. Um, but yes, mechanical react mechanical removal is pretty much the only option. You solvent removal just causes a bigger mess. Yeah, that's been my experience too. I would add to that with all the droppings, plus like here we get lizard droppings too, which are just fun. <laughs> yeah, weird. <laughs> so anyway. Well, that was our last question. So um, I'm going to refer everyone to the fact that in the chat, I put in the links to our resource page, which includes a copy of this presentation and some other resources that Megan put together. So I would encourage you to go take a look at that. There's also the survey monkey link for this webinar. So please fill that out. Um, the IMLS grant, we have it like another year or so on C2C Care. So if you fill those out and put your opinion in there, that'll help us figure out what we're doing next with C2C Care. So I encourage you to fill out those surveys. Um, Megan, do you have any other last things you want to tell our audience at all? No, but thank you for joining us today. And if you do have any questions, I am happy to answer them at any time. So feel free. I know my contact information is out there somewhere. <laughs> Otherwise, do you want me to post it in the chat? Is that yeah. useful? Yeah. Okay. More than I welcome do. to. Please do. Well, while she's doing that, I'm going to say thank you to Megan. Thank you to uh, Learning Times, our producers. Thank you to IMLS who fund this and FAIC. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed it. And uh, again, we have that next webinar happening in November. Again, if you deal with outdoor vehicles, talk a lot about outdoor sculptures. So I know people are out there dealing with large functional vehicles. If you do, um, please think about submitting it to, for us to take a look at at the next webinar, because I think that'll be fun to kind of see what the audience has to deal with across the country. And again, I know you folks have them. So <laughs> please feel free to put them in there. And yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope we will see you all soon. Oh, perfect. There it is. And Megan just put it in the chat. So thanks, Megan. And we'll make sure that's always on the website as well. Okay. Great. All right. Thank we'll you. Thank you.